Hey, welcome everybody. It's good to have you here with us. In today's episode, we're going to continue our teaching series through the book of Revelation. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to teach for two weeks at Grace Valley Church here in Memphis, Tennessee on the book of Revelation. Today we go after chapter six and seven and we we try to answer the question, which perspective on Revelation is the right one? We're going to cover two big ones today. I hope you enjoy this. Stick around. we got a great episode. Do me a favor. You're going to need a Bible today. Grab your Bibles and let's go to Revelation chapter 6. While you're turning to Revelation 6, I want to just introduce myself to those of you I haven't had the chance to meet yet. My name's Chad. Um, I hope that you are well-rested today. I hope that you had a nice big cup of coffee this morning. In fact, I hope you treated yourself to two cups of coffee. You're going to need it today, okay? Today will not be a day of theological baby food. It's going to be a day of theological steak and potatoes and garlic bread and maybe a fat slab of cheesecake at the end, all right? This will not be shallow end. This is going to be very deep end. Uh, In some ways, I feel like Pastor Andy was playing chess while I was playing checkers because he came to me and was like, hey, you want to do Revelation 4 and 5? And I was like, jackpot. And he goes, and can you also do 6 and 7? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll get there when I get there. And then I've got to 6 and 7 and realized what a heavy theological lift this text is today. Here's why Revelation 6 and 7 is, is so heavy. When you get to Revelation chapter 6, you're going to bump up against a question. And that question is, when exactly are these things taking place? We haven't had to address that question yet. Now in Revelation 6, we're going to have to address it. And you'll recall that back in week one, Pastor Andy laid out four different perspectives on the book of Revelation, addressing the question, when do these things happen? These four perspectives are considered to be safe, biblical, orthodox perspectives, uh, but there are some strengths that certain ones have over the others. So here are the four. There's the preterist. The preterist perspective says all these things took place in the past, specifically in AD 70. Then you have the historical perspective. The historical perspective says all of these things have happened throughout human history. One of the weaknesses with that perspective is that no no historian or no theologian lines up every historical event the same. So there's a little bit of inconsistency there. There's the futurist perspective. That's our third one. And that one says all of these events are still to come. Then we have the symbolic. It says everything here in Revelation is symbolic. It's not actual events. It's just symbols of what what happens in the Christian life. Now, I had an option today coming to this platform. I could have structured my sermon in a way that a lot of pastors will structure it. I have a perspective on the book of Revelation. I could have straw manned those other three perspectives, made them look silly, made them look inferior, and I could have steel manned my perspective, made it look like that's the only one to believe, that's the one that's right. But I didn't want to do that today because I don't think it appreciates the mystery that's in this book. This is the most mysterious book in all of the Bible. And I love that Pastor Andy laid out in week one, we have to approach this book with humility. We have to be okay with with admitting we might not know everything in here. And so the way I wanted to structure our time together today, I wanted to look at the two main perspectives. In evangelical circles, evangelical scholars, evangelical pastors, the two dominant perspectives you'll run up against are the preterist view and the futurist view. And what I wanted to do is walk through these two chapters today and tease out both of those perspectives in an effort to say, hey, look, these are two really good ways to look at the scriptures. And then at the very end, just to stir the pot, I'll share with you where I personally land, all right? Let's be sure we're clear on the preterist and the futurist view. The preterist says these things all happened between AD 67 and 70 AD, okay? they're going to take the words of Christ very seriously. The preterist looks at what Jesus says in the Olivet Discourse and puts a lot of weight onto it. Jesus, as he's talking with his disciples, the disciples look at the grandeur of the temple, and they say, look at how spectacular the temple is. 
And Jesus says to them, I tell you the truth, not one of those stones will be on top of the other. And then he goes into this whole discourse about the end, what the end is going to look like. And he says in that discourse, I tell you the truth, all of these things will come to pass in this generation. So the preterist says a generation in the Jewish mind is 40 years. They do the math. Jesus is saying this about AD 33. That puts 40 years then right about AD 70 when the temple is destroyed by the Romans. You see, the the Jews are uprising against the Roman Empire. In AD 67, the Romans come and they, they siege Jerusalem. They surround it and they cut it off from all food supply. And they slowly starve out the city for years. And in AD 70, they sack it, they burn Jerusalem to the ground. So the preterist goes, man, it looks a lot like this is happening right around that time. They'll date the book of Revelation to right about AD 60. Now the futurist is going to say something different. The futurist will say, no, no, this book was written about AD 90. It's written after the fall of Jerusalem. There may be some similarities in the fall of Jerusalem to what's coming, but ultimately this book has its fulfillment in the future. Futurists will point to a seven-year period that they call the tribulation. The tribulation is pulled from Daniel chapter 9, where Daniel talks about these blocks of seven years. He refers to them as weeks, and, and there's a week that is yet to occur. So the futurist says that seven-year period hasn't happened yet. It's coming, and that's when we read about this stuff. It is yet to take place. With those two understandings now, let's go to our text. We'll start off here, chapter 6, verse 1. We're going to march through two of these chapters. There's so much we could cover here. I'm going to have to fly at about 20,000 feet because I just can't get down into all the weeds, all right? But we're going to get a general idea of what these two sides are saying. Here's what chapter 6, verse 1 reads. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, come. And I looked and behold, a white horse and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him and he came out conquering and to conquer. All right, so we have here the first of the seven seals getting opened. We're only gonna see six seals that get opened and we see here a white horse. This white horse represents conquer. You may be tempted to think that this is representative of Jesus. Jesus will return on a white horse. Revelation 19 records that. But he doesn't return like this. We know that this can't be Jesus because what follows this white horse is not good. And if you read Revelation 19, when Jesus comes back, it's pretty good what follows after that. And then we also know Jesus is described as destroying his enemies with the sword of his mouth. Just his mere words decimate his enemies. Here, this rider has a bow. The weapon's different. So we know that this can't be Jesus. Who exactly is this white horse? You'll see four horse. This is where we get the idea of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This horse represents conquer. And the preterist is going to say, this white horse represents the Roman Empire. It's the Roman Empire coming to attack Jerusalem. The futurist, on the other hand, will say this is the Antichrist. In the scriptures, we see a man described. He is given the title the Antichrist. He is given the title the lawless one. This man is going to rise to power, global power that no other political figure ever has. The futurist gets that idea from Daniel 7. Daniel 7 talks about four kingdoms of the earth, and and it quite literally lays out the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, and then there's a fourth empire it doesn't specify. It doesn't name that fourth empire, but that fourth empire has unprecedented power. The futurist will also look at Daniel 9, and it talks about one who blasphemes against God, who exalts himself above God. And this one is going to create a covenant amongst the many. That refers to Israel and the neighboring nations. 
And so the futurist will say that the Antichrist is going to create a peace treaty in an area where there has never been peace. He's going to broker peace somehow amongst this incredibly volatile, chaotic area, and that will be part of his ascension to power. That's how the futurist reads this. This conquering, this white horse with the bow, he will ascend to power unlike anyone else. The preterist goes, no, 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 this is the Roman Empire, which had unprecedented power, had unprecedented military might. That's what this is referring to. So you got two sides here. We go from the white horse now into the second seal, the red horse. Here's how the text reads. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. The second seal here is the red horse, and it it symbolizes the ending of peace. The preterist is going to look at this, and they're going to say, this is the end of what's called the Pax Romana, Roman peace. This was something very popular within the Roman Empire. They bragged about how under the Roman Empire, there was Pax Romana, there was Roman peace. The Romans ruled with an iron fist, make no mistake. Any kind of uprising, any kind of challenge to their authority, they squashed it. But what it created was for a couple hundred years, peace across the largest empire that has ever existed. From the borders of England all the way to India. And what you have happening right about AD 67, the Jews start uprising against the Romans. You have in one year four different Caesars who attain the throne. They're conspiring against each other. They're killing each other. You have all kinds of rebellions outbreaking in the far reaches of the empire. This Roman peace that existed for hundreds of years in AD 67, it starts to tear apart. So the preterist looks at this and says, that's what it's referring to. It's referring to the Roman peace ending. The futurist, on the other hand, says, this is yet to come. The Antichrist will ascend to power, and he'll do it because he brokered peace. He was able to make peace where nobody could make peace. And his whole platform will be, I can bring peace and unity to the entire world. And that will be a false promise. He'll do it for a very short time. But then, we have in the scriptures, especially in Daniel the Antichrist exalting himself as God. He will demand worship of himself. And anybody that does not participate in that worship will also see it in Revelation. Anyone who doesn't exalt him as God, he will hunt, he will persecute, he will ultimately try to kill. This man who falsely promised peace will not produce any peace. So the futurist looks at this red horse and says, that's what it's picturing. Let's move now to the third horse. Verse five. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. And I looked and behold a black horse. And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and wine. All right, what in the world is happening here? Let's talk about the third seal, the black horse. This represents famine. This is talking about famine. Both the preterist and the futurist agree. They just disagree when this famine happens. The preterist says this famine is representing what Israel, what Jerusalem specifically went through when they're sieged by the Romans. You can literally read uh, the historian Josephus. He talks about the famine conditions in Israel, in Jerusalem during this time. It's horrendous. I'll spare you the details. But it goes so far as cannibalism. The, The Jews are cut off from their food. This was a very common tactic by the Romans. They would build siege works around a city and they would just choke it out. They would starve it, they would deprive it till everyone within the city was weak, and then they would send in their mighty, strong military force and destroy everyone. And that's what's happening here in Jerusalem. So the preterist goes, that's what it's talking about. There's famine here. 
You see in this picture here, there's a rider on the black horse holding scales. What does that mean? The scales represent very close measurement of money to food. And the text says here, a denarius for a quart of wheat. What does that mean? Okay, a denarius is one day's worth of work. And a quart of wheat at this time was thought to be the very bare minimum that an adult male could survive on. So in modern terms, it would be probably like four or five slices of bread. And you would have to work all day just to get that bare minimum of food. And then it also says you could get three quarts of barley for a whole day's worth of work. Barley is a rougher, less refined grain, oftentimes given to animals. So the text is saying here, you can work all day for like a couple slices of bread, or you can work all day for a couple scoops of like kibble and bits. That's kind of what it's talking about. And the picture here is food is sparse. Food is hard to come by. There's famine. So the preterist says that happened in the past. The futurist goes, this is what's coming in the future. Specifically, this is what's coming in the last three and a half years of the tribulation. The futurist will point to great, great judgments, great wrath of God that's poured out onto the earth. Fish are going to be killed. Livestock are going to be killed. Agriculture is going to be destroyed by the plagues and the wrath of God. And that is going to cripple the food supply in a way that would make like COVID shortages look, look laughable. The world will be crippled in its food supply. And the futurist goes, that's what this is talking about. Let's go now to the fourth and final horseman. Verse seven. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. I looked and behold a pale horse. Its rider's name was Death and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with famine, with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. This fourth horse here, he is described as being pale. In the Greek, it's actually chloros. That's the word that's used to describe it. That's where we get the word chlorophyll from. You could think of this almost as like a, like a sickly green kind of color. You know like that green vomiting emoji on your phone? Maybe similar to that. This is the only horse whose rider is named, and it's the only horse that has somebody following the rider. The rider is named Death. Hades comes right behind. Hades is the New Testament way of saying hell. How does the preterist and futurist look at this? Here's what they're going to say. The preterist will look at this and say, this is the death of all those during the siege of Jerusalem. You have the ending of peace. There's famine. Then it just logically follows all of the people that die in Jerusalem from the Roman attack. That's what they're going to say. The futurist points to the the future. They're going to say, no, this is coming during those seven years. This is all the death that will take place during the great tribulation. This is all the death that will happen from the plagues of God, the wrath of God. This is all the death that will happen from the Antichrist hunting his enemies. These sections here conclude the four horsemen. We move now out of the horsemen into, into a different picture but it's still Jesus opening the seals. Here's what what verse nine will read. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, Holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer. That's interesting. They weren't told to wait. They're told to rest. Rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. This fifth seal here is the cry of the martyrs. The cry of the martyrs. The preterist is gonna look at this and say, these are all martyrs, martyrs for all time, especially those martyrs who died during the siege of Jerusalem. The futurist says, 
We agree, it's martyrs for all time, but we would specify and say it's more specifically martyrs dying during these last seven years. There's quite a bit of agreement, there's quite a bit of an overlap between what the preterist and the futurist believes here. Now, this portion of scripture challenged me a lot this week. Because you wanna know what I felt when I immediately read this? Like verse 11 really troubled me. This is, this is like God Almighty speaking here. Each of them were given a robe, told to rest a little longer, and then it says, until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed. So I started reading that and I'm like, so that means God has in his mind a set number of people who are to die for his name. And maybe you're not like me, but, but my heart was immediately troubled. How, how in the world, Lord, are you gonna be so cavalier with human life? How in the world, Lord, are you gonna be just so casual? Like we're just expendable? You're just gonna let us die like this? And so I had to wrestle with this a little bit. I had to kind of dig into this a little bit. And as I'm wrestling, as I'm praying through this, the, the Lord has never spoken to me audibly. I would love for that to happen. Maybe I wouldn't because a lot of people respond actually pretty fearfully when that happens. But the way the Lord oftentimes speaks to me, like scripture will just pop into my head. So all these scriptures started just kind of popping into my head. Chad, do you give life and do you take life away? Did, did you create yourself, Chad? Chad, who formed you fearfully and wonderfully in your mother's womb? Who did that? Was that you? Chad, do you hold the universe together by the word of your power? Do you do that? Chad, does the clay have any right to say to the potter, why are you doing it this way? Chad, did you give your life up for me or did I give my life up for you? Am I calling you to anything that I haven't already done for you? And you want to know what, what it really started to reveal in my heart? This text really started to reveal in my heart how much I view God not as king, general, commander of my life. I view him as like a business partner. Hey, you do for me what I want and I'll do for you what you want. It's like quid pro quo. It's, it's all do what you want as long as you do what I want. But you know what that makes God? That makes God like a butler. That makes God like, hey, I'll, I'll pay you with church attendance. I'll pay you with Bible reading. I'll pay you with some prayers. But then you better bless me and you better give me what I want and you better make my life comfortable. And the Bible doesn't paint God like a butler. He's not. He's king. He's God Almighty. And my life isn't my own. He has numbered my days. He holds my days in his hands. And so when I started reading this and, and the thought popped into my head, what if I'm one of these people? What if God sees me as one of these people who, who will shed blood for the name of Christ? Would I be willing to do that? Is my view of God big enough to sustain that kind of sacrifice? And, and it's been a hard week. And I would say to you right now, my knees would probably shake. My voice would probably quiver. But yeah, I'd take a bullet for this. Amen. I would. I'm convinced to the core of my being that he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And listen, my life's gonna end anyways. My life's gonna end anyways. It doesn't matter how much yoga I do, how much spinach I eat, doesn't matter how much water I drink, I'm still gonna die. What greater cause to die for than the king of kings, than the kingdom that's never ever gonna end. A very wise man once said, he is no fool who gives up what he can't keep to gain what he cannot lose. That's what I'm after. Amen. So yeah, I'd probably be scared. And I'd probably ask, Lord, why like this? And I'd probably have a lot of doubt but I'd take a bullet for it. Six seal. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth and the full moon became like blood 
and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb, for great, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? The sixth seal here is the great day of wrath. And the preterist is going to look at that text we just read and say, that's the fall of Jerusalem. They'll say this is apocalyptic language. It's an apocalyptic genre. Meaning, the the kind of poetic style that's written here isn't to be taken super literally. It's more of describing how cataclysmic the fall of Jerusalem was. Like, think about it. This is where Jesus, he walked through the temple here. This is where the very presence of God Almighty used to dwell. And now it's destroyed. Jesus says to the the Israelites before he leaves, he says, behold, your house is left to you desolate. The destruction of where God's presence used to dwell, where the Son of God spoke and ministered right there. It's, it's tarnished, broken down. The Romans burned it and, and brought the whole thing down to the ground. So the preterist says, this is, our, uh, this is apocalyptic language to describe that great fall. The futurist says, there may be similarities in the fall to what's coming, but there are things here that were not fulfilled in A.D. 70. And they will read this a little bit more literally. They're going to say, no, there is a massive global earthquake. The preterist will point to, there were earthquakes in Pompeii, Colossae, Laodicea, right around this time. So there were earthquakes that correspond to this. The, The futurist goes, no, 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 not a local. The Greek word here is seismos, a shaking global shaking, to the extent, the text says, islands and mountains are displaced. Think of the the geological disruption that that would cause. Think of the volcanic activity that that would cause. The text says stars are falling through the sky. Uh, The futurist will say those are meteors striking the earth. Unbelievable volcanic eruptions, clouds of dust and dirt, meteors falling through the sky. This would fundamentally change the atmosphere. The atmosphere turns darker. The text says here the sky vanishes. It rolls up like a scroll. The sun becomes like black sackcloth. The moon turns red. So the the futurist is going to go, no, this is an actual event where God is pouring out wrath onto the earth. He's fundamentally, cataclysmically changing the earth. And that's how they'll read it. Now, that's the first six seals. Six seals. We won't see the seventh seal opened until chapter eight. And the seventh seal is a doozy. I won't spoil it, but it's a doozy. We get now to a little interlude. Chapter seven is a little break in the action. Six seals have been opened, and then we see two groups of people. Chapter seven is going to begin with the 144,000. We see Israel, the great multitude. Who exactly are these 144,000 that are talked about here? Let me read this text here, and then we'll we'll unpack this. We'll go verse one through eight if you're tracking here. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. All right, so let's talk there. There's a lot of people out there that like to believe the earth is flat. This text is not saying the earth is flat. It's like four corners. It's a rectangle. It's a square. No, it's talking about the cardinal directions of the earth, north, south, east, and west. So it's talking about how uh, the wind blows from all of these different cardinal directions. And there's powerful angels standing there. We know it's talking about directions because look at verse 2. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun 
Where does the sun rise? In the east. So we know this is talking about directions here. Rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. Let's talk here, because this word seal is going to get important. Uh, Seal is like a marking. This idea of being sealed is all through the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. We see it very pronounced in the New Testament. John 6, Jesus is described as being sealed by God. Ephesians chapter 1, believers are described as being sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. And we see here this angel rising in the east has the marking of God on him. He rises in the east with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. This idea of sealing will become important later on in Revelation because we're going to see the Antichrist take a play out of God's book. The Antichrist is going to create his own kind of seal. You may have heard it called the mark of the beast. It will be very similar in nature to what's happening here. Here's the sealing. Verse 5, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph. And finally, you guessed it, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. Now, here's the question. Who in the world are these 144,000? Who's being talked about here? Let's look at the two views. The preterist is going to say, these are Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who are spared. They're spared from the attack by the Romans. You see, Jesus, in his Olivet Discourse, he says If you see the city surrounded, flee to the mountains. He literally says that. Run to the mountains. Get out. When you see this city surrounded, you need to book it. Get out of here. And so the preterist says, this isn't an exact, like, perfect number. This is representative of the church, Jewish Christians. They argue this because this 144,000 in Revelation 14, they're referred to, this group is referred to as the first fruits of the redeemed. That's the title they're given. And so they look at the Bible and they look at church history. They go, well, the first fruits of the redeemed, it happened in Jerusalem. That's where the first Christians were started. So they see this as a group of Christians who heeded the wisdom of Christ. When they saw the city surrounded, they booked it. They got out. And they see this as divine protection from God on those Jewish Christians. The futurist looks at this and says, This is a special group of Jewish men who are to come. They look at Revelation 14 as well. These men are described as having a special degree of sexual purity. They're they're celibate. They, They dedicate their bodies to the Lord in a very unique, special way. Uh, Revelation 14 says they have a song they sing to the Lord that is only known by them. They are described as servants of the Most High God. The futurist then looks at these group, this group right here and says, no, these are actual Jewish men who during this seven-year tribulation will be servants, will be witnesses, they'll be evangelists to the God of the universe. They point to Zechariah 12 and 13, which says, in these end times, God will pour out on the house of David a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on him who they have pierced and they will weep for him as one weeps for an only child. That's very different than how the Jews see Jesus right now. The majority of Jews hold Jesus as a false prophet. Many sects of Judaism won't even talk about Jesus. But there's coming a day where on the house of David, this spirit of grace is poured out onto them. 
and they'll see Christ for who he is, and they will be witnesses during this time of chaos to his name. That's how the, the futurist looks at this. We get 144,000, then the number gets even bigger. It goes to a great multitude. Here's how the text reads. Pick it up with me in verse nine. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Palm branches are like a sign of victory. And crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? I said to him, sir, you know, I kind of chuckle when I read that. John has seen some of the wildest things a human can see, and now he's getting quizzed by one of these elders, and John's just like, I don't know, man. Can you just please tell me? I can barely understand what I'm seeing. Just please, you let me know. The elder said to him, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Here's how the preterist will see this. Here's how the futurist sees this. The great multitude. The great multitude is the elect of God for all time. That's how the preterist sees it. The futurist will see it. This is the elect of God and those who are being saved by God during the seven-year tribulation. This is kind of an interesting thing for me. You see, during this great time of wrath on the earth, the futurist view holds, even though God is pouring out wrath onto the earth, even in his wrath, millions and millions of people will be saved. There will be a great turning of souls to King Jesus, even during this time of wrath. And so the, the, fut- the preterist goes, this is people who have died throughout human history. Future says no. Human history and those during this seven year. And then finally, we get here to verse 15, and this is a doxology that both groups can agree on. Both groups say the same thing. We, we agree with this wholeheartedly in the same way. Here's what 15 says. Therefore, they, the, this people, clothed in white before the lamb, before the throne, therefore, they are before the throne of God, and watch this, and serve him day and night in his temple. All right, let's pause. Heaven is not going to be you sitting on a cloud playing a harp for all of eternity. Amen. Because if that's what heaven's about, I don't know if I want in. Maybe electric guitar, and I might be interested, but the harp? No, man. Here's the cool thing about heaven. You read this text right here, go to the end of Revelation, Revelation 20, Revelation 21, Revelation 22. It's going to say you and I in the new heavens and the new earth, we're gonna bring in the glory of the nations before the throne. We're gonna bring it into the new temple. It says right here that we're gonna actively serve. You and I are going to have meaningful, fulfilling work in heaven. It will not be toilsome. It will not stress us out. It will not leave us tired. Our new heavenly bodies will only ever increase in strength, ever increase in joy, ever increase in delight in how we serve the Lord and work unto his glory. That's pretty good news. Heaven's not going to be boring. We'll have real, cool, meaningful work. We serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst nor anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. The lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. I love that play there, lamb and shepherd. He's both. He's a lamb and a shepherd. I love that. He will guide them to springs of living water. Then you better underline this one. And God will wipe away 
every tear from their eyes. Both the preterist and the futurist would look at this and say, hallelujah, amen, what a blessed hope is coming for us. So here's two chapters, two different views. Let me ask this question to try to make it personal. What do we do with all of this? What do we do with all of this theology? What do we do? Let me grab this. What do we do with all of of this text that we've just seen here? A couple of points. Number one, hold your position with humility. Okay? I told you I would share what my personal view is on this. And here's where I personally land on the book of Revelation. And I hold it very much with an open hand. I would be classified as a futurist. I think these things are still to come. And more specifically, this is really getting in the weeds. This is nerding out on theology. I love to nerd out on theology. I would be classified as a premillennial futurist. I believe Jesus will come back, then the millennium starts. That's what I would hold to. I would also be a pre-tribulational futurist. That means I believe that the church is going to be raptured first, then the seven years will start. I hold that very much with an open hand because there's a lot of brilliant scholars, brilliant men and women of faith who would disagree with me on that. I hold to that, especially around the tribulation, because uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, you and I have not been appointed to suffer wrath. Well, Revelation 6 just described what we saw as a time of wrath, correct? So if that's a time of wrath and we're not appointed to suffer wrath, it makes sense to me that we're not going to be here. Also, if you look at uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, it talks about the man of lawlessness, this Antichrist. And it says that there is a restraining force on this man of lawlessness. Every other explanation I've heard that tries to explain that restraining force has fallen short. The only one that seems to really make sense to me is that the restraining force is the church. There's a lot of other explanations, but the church seems to be the most biblical, the most logical. So then it would make sense that the church is pulled out before this man of lawlessness is revealed. Now, there are godly men like R.C. Sproul, B.B. Warfield, the great Puritan theologian, Jonathan Edwards. He would disagree with me. He would go, no, man, I read it completely different. And so here's what I want to do. I want to hold that with an open hand. Because the day and age that you and I are living in, I'm going to probably, I might offend some people here. Is it all right? Maybe I offend some people. We're living in a day and age where they're telling us men can be women and women can be men. It's being preached in our culture that it's a good thing. It's good to chemically alter and surgically mutilate people. That the image of God that is fearfully and wonderfully made by the Most High No, destroy it, alter it, mutilate it, and that's good. Church, the enemy is at our doorstep. We do not need to be fighting each other over end-time theology. We we can have healthy discussions over a cup of coffee. We can have friendly, like, interscholastic debate over this, but we don't need to be going onto social media. We don't need to be blasting people because they're a preterist and we're a futurist, or, or they're a futurist and we're a preterist. It's too crazy out there. And one of the tactics that the enemy loves to do against the church is he loves to get us cannibalizing each other over secondary and tertiary issues. So let's major on the things that the scriptures major on. Character of Christ, nature of God, sufficiency of the scriptures, Jesus' blood alone. We'll die on those hills. But some of these more secondary, third-level things, let's hold them with humility. There's too many enemies out there, man. We need to lock arms right now, not snipe each other in the Facebook comments. You tracking with me? All right, second thing. Repent before a holy God. I know that sounds so 1950s. I know that sounds so like Southern Baptist hellfire and brimstone. But listen, our God, he is so merciful. He is so gracious. He is so long-suffering and He is an all-consuming fire. And he will not be mocked. And it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
Because what the preterist and the futurist would both agree with here is that God judges wickedness. So patient, so long-suffering, yes and amen, so gracious, lavishly gracious, yes and amen. And he will call wickedness to account. And so there's no greater loving act I could do today. There is no greater act of kindness I could do than to tell you, turn from your sin. Throw yourself under the mercy of Christ. Let the blood of Christ wipe all your sins clean. Let the grace of Jesus heal you. Let the Spirit of God heal you and renew you. Turn from your sin and trust in Jesus because wrath is coming. And I know, I know that sounds like the crazy guy on the street corner with the picket sign, but it's not false. It's true. Judgment will come. And today, in God's grace, like it's by God's grace you're here hearing this. So I don't know what kind of sin, I don't know what kind of addiction, I don't know what kind of struggle you got. Today, turn, throw yourself under the mercy of Christ. And finally, at the risk of maybe sounding too harsh and too 1950s, let me encourage you with this. Take heart. Christ has overcome. What do I mean by this? I mean, he's overcome two things in particular. He's overcome your sin. That's one of the hardest things, at least for me, to believe. He has overcome my sin by his shed blood. I think one of the most beautiful verses in all of the scriptures is Romans chapter eight, verse one. There is therefore now, right now, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None, zero, zilch. Yeah, but Chad, what about that stuff I did last night? Yeah, it's been forgiven. It was forgiven when Christ hung up on the cross. You haven't surprised Jesus. You haven't caught Jesus off guard. It wasn't like Jesus forgave 99 of your sins, but that last one he was surprised by. He knew it all. He knew what he was getting when he hung up on the cross. He knew what his blood would cover. There is therefore now. So I know how church goes. I know that you come into this room with a lot of heaviness, a lot of sin, a lot of addiction that you're like, gosh, I can't believe this thing's still here. Take heart. Christ has conquered your sin. In Christ If you are in Christ, the Father looks down on you and sees you as holy, blameless, and above reproach. Not because you actually are, but because by Christ's merits, he has made you that. And then secondly, Christ has overcome evil. Like we read back in chapter 5 last week, that even those who rebel against Jesus, they will bow and they will admit, he's king, he's Lord. Listen, Jesus has defeated evil. There is no evil in this world. There's no corruption right now in this world that will not be answered for by King, by King Jesus. He'll call it all to account. So I know there's tons of corruption in our political system. I know there's tons of fighting and it feels like everything's falling apart. I get that. But rest assured, Jesus Almighty will call all unrepentant sin to account and he we'll wipe every tear from our eyes. So here's how we're gonna end our time. We're gonna close in prayer in just a second. The worship band's gonna come up behind me and we're gonna just take some time to sing and worship to the Lord. Uh, I'm gonna invite our prayer team. If you're a part of our prayer team, when we start singing, they're gonna be up front. I'll be up front here as well. If there's anything we can pray about with you, for you, we would love to join in that. Let's pray. Father, I wanna thank you for your word. I wanna thank you for... um, got a heavy passage, a hard passage to teach through, but just a great passage. Um, help us now, Lord, to walk in humility, to hold our views with a charitable heart. Lord, quicken our hearts unto repentance. God, I personally am just so prone to wander. I'm so prone to be attracted by the things of this world. Lift my eyes unto a more beautiful God. Lift my eyes unto a more beautiful heavenly Savior endear my heart more to you instead of these little shiny trinkets of the world. God, I I just once again, I want to re-anchor my heart. The blood of Christ has saved me. The spirit of the living God is renewing me, regenerating me. He starts that good work and he will finish it. And so now, Lord, I want to sit in that. I want to worship in that. I want to draw closer to you, Lord. And I pray the same for my friends here. Meet us now in this time. And I pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.